Good evening. I'm Bree Mobius, and I'm the president of the Sacramento chapter of the Federal Bar Association. On behalf of the Eastern District Historical Society and the Sacramento chapter of the Federal Bar Association, it is my privilege to welcome you tonight to our panel discussion on the trial, investigation, and aftermath of Unabomber Theodore Kaczynski. This panel discussion is the second in our series of significant cases from the Eastern District of California. Our first installment last year covered the trial of Lynette Squeaky Frome. We are fortunate again this year to have Judge Shub return to moderate our panel. Judge Shub is a senior district judge from the Eastern District of California, and he also served as the chief judge at the time of the Unabomber trial. Judge Shub is also the founder of the Eastern District Historical Society. It is now my privilege to turn the proceedings over to Judge Shub. Thank you, Bree. It was in May of 1978 when a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago found a mysterious package in the parking lot. When a campus policeman attempted to open the package, it exploded, injuring the officer. This was just the first of 16 bombs delivered over a span of the next 17 years to individuals in various locations across the United States. All but two of them caused serious injuries. Three resulted in death. Law enforcement shortly came to the conclusion that the bombs were all being sent by the same person, whom they dubbed the Unabomber. Understandably, the public was struck with fear, not knowing when or where the Unabomber would strike next. The investigation came to a head in 1995 when the Unabomber sent a 35,000-word essay to the New York Times, the New York Post, Penthouse Magazine, and other publications, containing his so-called manifesto, and offering to cease his bombings if they would publish it. With the approval of law enforcement, the Times and the Post published the manifesto. And when David Kaczynski, read the contents of it, he began to think the unthinkable, that it was written by his brother, Ted. Working with the information provided by David Kaczynski, law enforcement was able to obtain a search warrant for a cabin occupied by Ted Kaczynski in an authorized area near Lincoln, Montana. With what they found in that search, law enforcement had enough to arrest Ted Kaczynski and the decision was made by the United States Department of Justice to bring the prosecution here in the Eastern District of California. The decision was also made to ask for the death penalty. The defendant was indicted in April of 1996, and the trial began in the courtroom of United States District Judge Garland E. Burrell, Jr. in late 1997. After a lengthy jury selection process, in January of 1998, the defendant suddenly agreed to plead guilty in exchange for a sentence of life in prison without parole. In our panel discussion uh, here this evening, we hope to discuss, among other things, how the FBI managed the investigation of such serious crimes, extending over such a lengthy period of time in such a vast geographical area. We'll also discuss the effect that those crimes had on their victims, one in particular. We'll talk about why and how the decision was made to allow the publication of the Unabomber's manifesto. We also hope to discuss what was involved in seeking and obtaining the search warrant and how the decision was made to bring the prosecution here in the Eastern District of California. We hope to learn about the prosecution strategy, including the decision to seek the death penalty. We'll also learn the defense strategy. Finally, how the agreement was ultimately reached for the defendant to plead guilty in exchange for a life sentence. We have a distinguished panel with us this evening to discuss these subjects. Their full resumes are found in your program. Uh, first, uh, to my immediate left, Terry Turchi was a special agent for the FBI for 35 years. Between 1994 and 1998, he was the assistant special agent in charge of the Unabom Task Force. He's co-author of four books, 
One of them uh, is entitled Hunting the American Terrorist, the FBI's War on Homegrown Terror. And the most recent one, which has the most relevance to this discussion, is entitled Unabomber, How the FBI Broke Its Own Rules to Capture the Terrorist Ted Kaczynski. Our next panelist to his left is Gary Wright. He was a computer store operator in Salt Lake City and was the victim, he prefers to say survivor, of the Unabomber's 12th bomb attack on February 20th, 1987. He has since developed a friendship with the defendant's brother, David Kaczynski. To his left, Judge Robert Stephen Lapham is a California Superior Court judge presently presiding over juvenile court proceedings in Sacramento. He was an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of California, handling several high-profile cases in Sacramento between 1984 and 2013. And he was a member of the prosecution team in the Kaczynski case. Finally, to his left, Quinn Denver is a Sacramento attorney who served as the California State Public Defender from 1977 to 1984. And at the time of the Unabomber trial, he was the federal defender for this district and lead counsel on Ted Kaczynski's defense team. I would be remiss if I did not introduce one other individual who is present uh, but not on the panel, the judge who presided over the Kaczynski proceedings, uh, Judge Garland E. Burrell, Jr. Now, uh, to get off uh, the discussion, Terry, uh, why don't you tell us how you got involved in the Unabomber investigation and how that, how that came about? Sure. Like uh, most FBI agents for us, it was kind of a reluctant involvement uh, for myself. On April 1st of uh, 1994, at about 12.35 p.m., and I could probably give you the seconds, down in uh, the Palo Alto Resident Agency, where I was very, very happy, Judge, uh, working national security cases, I received a call from our uh, assistant special agent at the time of uh, counterintelligence, uh, Ed Appel. And he said, uh, Terry, I just got off the phone with Jim Freeman. He's, he was our special agent in charge at the time. And uh, here's what I have to ask you. How would you like to come up to San Francisco and take over the Unabom Task Force, which had been established a year earlier after the 1993 uh, simultaneous bombings, one, uh, b both of those mailed from here in Sacramento, uh, to different parts of the coast. And uh, I smiled to myself, kind of. I said, well, that's a nice offer, Ed, and I'm good here. I love Palo Alto. I love being around Stanford, so I'm good. But thank you. And there was a pause, and he said, well, that wasn't a multiple choice question. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like you to, to consider coming on up here uh, as soon as you can. So I said, well, OK, um, how about a month? That'll give me time to kind of wrap everything up here. and." Uh, we can find a new acting supervisor, and I'll, I'll head up to San Francisco. He said, how about in a couple of hours? And uh, that's how many of us got into Unibom. In fact, most of us, because of the length of this case, and I will use the words almost sheer hopelessness, and that's kind of how we thought about it, we all tried to avoid that corridor in the federal building in San Francisco that you walk down that housed the Unibom task force. So that's how I got started. Well, the investigation had been ongoing for a number of years. Can you summarize uh, what the FBI had learned before you got involved? I can. The investigation had, as the judge said, had gone on since May of 1978. And even though there were, up to this time, there were 14 bombings, there would be two more bombings while we were assembled as the UTF or the latest iteration of the UTF. We, uh, we didn't know a lot, but we knew certain factual details where we had questions, but we had no answers. And uh, in looking back, particularly at the first three crimes, they became very important to us as we tried to look at a new way to put this case together. The first bombing, the one that uh, happened in May of 1978, the main question was this. There was a package found at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle Campus out in the Scientific and Technology <laughs> Building parking lot. It had $10 in uncanceled stamps. And, uh, Somebody went to pick it up and uh, eventually got it to the police, and it was harmlessly exploded. But we never were able to answer that question all of those years of why do we have a package that had a return address of Northwestern University in Chicago, an actual addressee, and then $10 in uncanceled stamps. Why wasn't this package mailed? 
So that was one of the things we needed to focus on. By a year later, May of 1979, another bomb was found, only this time it was found inside Northwestern University. That struck us as very interesting because first bomb, we had a uh, return address of Northwestern. Now we have uh, a bomb actually at Northwestern. And so we thought a lot about that and we, we again tried to look at what possibly could be uh, a connection between those two bombs. And then the third bombing in November of 1979, which got everyone's attention, a bomb was placed on American Airlines Flight 444 headed out of Chicago O'Hare Airport, headed for Washington National. There was a bomb placed on the plane via the mail that had been built with a barometer and fashioned as an altimeter. And it was uh, to go off at a certain altitude. And when it did go off, because it was under a lot of cargo and luggage in the cargo hold, it started a fire rather than actually uh, exploded as it was supposed to be. Uh, by the time this plane did an emergency landing at Dulles Airport and the pilots were able to get down and take a look at the damage when the fire was out, they were prepared to say that uh, years later that had this fire burned just a couple more inches closer to the main hydraulic line, this plane would have crashed. There would have been nothing we could have done to stop it. So at that point, the FBI uh, lab expert, Chris Rone, uh, looked at this bomb and, and the parts and thought, it's very strange that we haven't seen any other bombs built by someone who would do this. So he sent out a bulletin and an alert to all kinds of agencies, and he got a call from the ATF. And they referenced the first two bombings in 1978 and 1979, brought all this together, and then we realized in November of 1979 we now have a serial bombing case. How did the name Unabomber or Unabomb get coined? The first two bombings were at or involved uh, universities, Northwestern University and RPI up in Troy, New York. The first uh, bomb with the, with the return address of Northwestern, the second bomb in the graduate student room in May 1979 at Northwestern uh, gave us universities as targets. By the time that this bomb was placed on the American Airlines flight, we now have universities and airlines. So this became, as you know, the FBI likes to attach these uh, fancy names to its cases. Most of get public attention, and this certainly did. Universities and airline bombings. Unibomb. Right. We have a uh, chart behind us uh, of uh, all of the bombings uh, without getting into all of the details. Uh, what was the sequence of events after the first three? After the first three bombings, we would eventually have 13 more bombings for a total of 16, as the judge earlier mentioned. Um, in 1980, the airline aspect of this got another boost. Percy Wood, the president of United Airlines in his Lake Forest home, Lake Forest, Illinois, received a package in the mail. But about a week before he received the package, he received a letter. And the letter was written to him by someone named, uh, who signed the letter, Enoch Fisher. And in this letter, he said, you're going to be getting in the mail a package for me, a present. And uh, you don't know me, but uh, anybody like you, President of United Airlines, who makes decisions affecting the public welfare needs to read the book that I'm sending you. And the book turned out to be a, uh, a novel that was written at the time. Even the author, Sloan Wilson, really said, I don't really have any social significance to my book, so I don't really know what they're talking about. I just kind of came up with it one day. But uh, the uh, Percy Wood actually received that package that next week. When he went to open it, the book had been carved out and there was a bomb built into the book. And uh, he suffered significant injuries when he opened this book in his house. So that was the fourth event. And all of those had a nexus to uh, Chicago. Then no more nexus to Chicago. We're done with Chicago and by 1981 we move on to Salt Lake City. In 1981 a bomb was placed left in a hallway at the University of Utah Business Building. Exploded in the bathroom harmlessly because somebody had noticed it and the police took it in there and detonated it. Uh, but uh, we weren't able to do much with that. Uh, just a few months later, we had yet another bombing. Uh, this bomb was mailed from uh, Brigham Young University and ended up with a professor at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. After that, the next bomb, 1982, was at Quarry Hall at the University of California at Berkeley. That became a very important bombing. The victim there, the person who 
fortunately was able to survive his injuries, had gone into another graduate student room on the fourth floor of the University of California at Berkeley at Quarry Hall. And uh, when you go and you visit that and you look at that area, you realize or it hits you that someone who came up here and had the uh, presence of mind and, and was not anxious about coming to this location on the fourth floor to leave this bomb here, very similar to what happened at Northwestern with bombing number two. So that really made us start to think about that. And then no more bombs between 1982 and 1985. We then... Uh, Sadly, started calling 1985 the year of the Unabomber. There were four bombs in 1985. One was at Boeing Corporation, addressed to the Boeing uh, Fabrication Division in Seattle, Washington. All of the evidence from that bombing, uh, gone, never to be seen again, because it was detonated harmlessly in a uh, kind of a tar pit up there, and so we could never get anything back from that bombing. Uh, after that, another bombing at Quarry Hall at the University of California at Berkeley. This time on the, as you walk in off the street on the street level and then go down a very, very narrow corridor that was occupied by graduate students. Again, just like the uh, bombing in 1979 at Northwestern. <laughs> by the, uh, by uh, the fall of 1979, we have a bomb going to Professor James McConnell. Again, another come on to Professor McConnell which I'll describe a little bit more in a minute. And then finally, in uh, December of 19, uh, 1985, the, the Unabomber had his first, uh, as he called it later, a success uh, with one of his bombs. <coughs> and uh, that was right here in Sacramento, California, out here at um, Century, the old Century Plaza strip mall, uh, a place called Rentec Computer Store. Uh, a gentleman there named uh, Hugh Scrutton, who was the owner of that store, came out from the door into the back parking lot one day around noon, and he saw on the ground, lying by a car, what appeared to be a road hazard, I'm sure, in his mind. It was uh, kind of a combination of Douglas fir and two-by-fours and uh, a redwood two-by-fours nailed together. Out of the two-by-fours and Douglas fir, there, were, uh, there was um, nails protruding. And uh, unbeknownst to him, inside these uh, pieces of wood, the bomber had carved into the, uh, the insides and built the bomb. And uh, when Mr. Scrutton went over to move this so it wouldn't cause problems for any, any harmless passerby, as soon as he reached over to kind of break the contact between that device and the uh, ground, it was a passive device, and uh, it exploded. And it killed Mr. Scrutton almost instantly uh, on that morning. The next bomb, I believe, was in Salt Lake City. <coughs> And uh, that involved our next panelist, Gary Wright. Gary, why don't you tell us what happened? Sure. Um, so yeah, just really similar to what Terry was just saying with the uh, structure of the bomb. So uh, 1987, I owned a computer company in Salt Lake City. Uh, my family worked there with me. Um, I'd been out on calls just working from about 6 in the morning, got back to the office around 1030, and pulled into the rear parking lot of our, uh, our building. At that time, I owned the building. And as I pulled into the parking lot, I looked down in, um, next to my secretary's car, so I had pulled in next to hers. Um, there was a piece of wood. It was kind of similar, like you say, but different. It was two two-by-fours put together and had four nails sticking out of it. Um, those four nails have always stuck in my mind because I can always remember one in particular. It was up on the right-hand corner, and it was bent just a little bit. But they were also the shiniest nails I'd ever seen. They looked like chrome, like something handmade, if you will. Um, but I, I walked out of my car, went over, thought, same thing. There's something in the road. I need to get rid of it. Somebody will run over it, step on it, whatever. Um, but when I, I went over and went to pick it up, um, there was something really quite wrong. I mean, there was an Im immediate uh, feeling of huge pressure and uh, the sound of like a jet fighter going over, so like a screaming sound, if you will. And instantly, I'd moved a, a long way. I didn't, I didn't know how I got there, but I, I realized I was jumping up and down like I was on a pogo stick. And uh, I was hollering for my family. Everyone worked for me, my mom, my dad, my brothers. Um, and they came out the back of the door, but as I'm jumping around back there, the only way I can describe the next thing I saw was kind of like the matrix. So everything went into slow motion, if you will. You hear this at times, and I, I can tell you it's true. But I was looking at the uh, power and the telephone lines that went into the building, 
and they were moving in a slow sine wave, you know, very slowly moving. And I was watching pieces of things drift down around me, and there was a piece of red tape just kind of spinning around and like confetti. And I'm thinking, God, man, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, you know, I'm going, what happened? And at that second, though, I really thought, well, I'm not going to make it. I thought somebody had come around the corner of the building and shot me with a shotgun for some reason. Um, uh, my family came out at that point, and I could uh, see my dad was trying to say something to me. Um, I was reading his lips pretty much because it was like being underwater in a swimming pool. Um, you could kind of hear, but not really hear. And so he had been a uh, state trooper in Salt Lake and had seen lots of things. And then I could tell he was pretty upset. I'm going, well, okay, dad's upset. Maybe this is bad. So <laughs> slowly he and my brothers, they took me over, sat me on the uh, edge of the tailgate of one of the trucks and um, sat there for a few minutes. And I started to get, I knew it was shock coming at that point. But while I was sitting there, I looked down and I was dressed really nicely, had a dress shirt on. And I saw that my pants were gone from about the knees down. Um, I had on a white dress shirt, and there was these things. I couldn't figure out what they were in the, in the beginning. They were just like threaded through my shirt like needles. And I thought, what the heck? And I kept trying to put my head down to look, but I was, I was running into trouble. What it was was when the bomb exploded, it was inside of two-by-fours that had been hollowed out, but it was all the slivers. So they had come up and impaled themselves. And the doctor later told me, he said, yeah, you look like a porcupine. I said, well, okay. Um, that's uh, uh, something where they, they say life changes in a minute, but it's really life changes in a millisecond. You, you just never know. Um, we walked into the building. Uh, my, I laid down. I got really calm and um, took everything off I had, gave it to my mom, and just you know laid there. And I guess I really realized it was pretty serious because the next thing I see coming through the back door so you think maybe a police officer, but it's like 25 police officers, and then when the ambulance crew comes in, there's five of them, and I don't know how you fit five guys into an ambulance, but they were pretty successful. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I said, uh, well, this, this might be worse than I thought. And I guess the, the, the real moral of the story of all of this is, it's not really fun when they cut your clothes off and your mom's sitting there. <laughs> it's probably the most humbling thing you're going to run into. So I said, Mom, can you just please leave? You know, this, this is not so, so good right now. But um, ultimately that day they took me up to the hospital. Um, I waited about, uh, I got there at 10.30 at the hospital, pretty close. And they started surgery at 6 p.m. Had no painkillers or anything till that point. And I can tell you the body's natural morphine is a pretty amazing thing. It, uh, if you get hit, you really, it really doesn't hurt. So that uh, was a good thing for me to know. Um, I went through three surgeries. Uh, the first night they basically went in and um, found that I had severed a nerve in my left arm. When the bomb exploded, it was moving very rapidly. And when some of that metal came apart, it was actually liqu liquefied. And when it went into my arm, it actually cauterized the artery. So I didn't bleed. It just went in there and the metal was there. So um, I was pretty lucky in that regard. So that night they did a bunch of the face stuff, took out about 200 pieces of shrapnel from my legs and things like that. Uh, the, uh, that was on a Friday, Friday the, the 20th of February. Um, I went home Sunday. I didn't want to be in the hospital anymore and decided to recover a little bit at home. Two weeks later I went back into the... Uh, the hospital for another surgery to try and graft the, the nerve in my left arm back together. Um, and they had to ultimately, if you have a funny bone, we all do, right? They had to take it out and move it to the top of my arm. And I tell people now, I said, you know, there's things that don't work, but I'm probably the fastest nine-fingered typist you're going to know. So, you know, I'm good with that. Um, finally, a surgery later had to uh, transfer tendons and things in my hand. And it was really strange when the doctor got in there. Most people have two tendons in their thumb. I actually had three. And it was funny because I needed to graft one into my, my index finger. So kind of lucky, weird, strange. Um, don't know why those things happen. But um, that's, a, that's a morning that probably changes um, your family's lives in uh, ways you don't know. Terry, how much time passed between the bombing that killed Hugh Scrutton that you've described and the bombing that Gary's just described? Well, we had six years go by. 
No, 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 between the time of the bombing before his and, and Gary's. <coughs> Six years in between those. Run that by me again. How much time between the bombing that killed Hugh Scruton and the bombing that Gary's just described? Okay, the bombing that killed uh, Hugh Scruton was in 1985 and uh, Gary's bombing was in 1987. So we had about a year and a half. All right. Months. Now, uh, how much time between the bombing Terry, uh, that Gary's just described and the next bombing? And there we had six years, right. 1993. Now, do you have a theory as to why there was so much more time after this one than there was before? The uh, topic of uh, why did we have all this time was widely debated. And then when we finally had the right guy and uh, found uh, a number of Theodore Kaczynski's writings, we found that during that time he was actually experimenting to build smaller, more compact bombs and more lethal bombs. And that's why when we start talking about the latter series of these bombings, instead of boxes and packages and two by fours, you li literally had something the size of a video cassette that was placed in the mail to the future victims. In other words, th th he had one death and the next one was a failure. He didn't, that's right. did not kill Gary. Right. Do, do you have any theory as to why Gary was, was not killed in that bombing? Well, uh, Gary and I have actually talked about that. Uh, first of all, uh, it, there's just a lot of gratefulness there that it worked out that way, but I think some of it is the way that Gary actually approached that bomb. Yeah. Uh, we feel that Mr. Scrutton walked over, as any of us would probably do, to pick up wood from your best vantage point to, to pick it up and get the weight and get it out of the way. Uh, Gary, when he walked, and then he took that full brunt of that explosion, when Gary walked up, you kind of had the, uh, as you've told me, the inclination to kind of reach to the edge, and you yeah. kind of moved it, and so when you moved it slightly, it exploded, and the force went in a different direction rather than had he picked it up in a different way. The final two bombs did result in death, is that right? They did. Uh, the last two bombs, 15 and 16, uh, Thomas Moser was an advertising executive in uh, Caldwell, New Jersey. He got one of those bombs in the mail. It was uh, just a week or two before Christmas, and uh, the kids, he had little kids running around the kitchen. Uh, they were getting ready to go get a Christmas tree. And uh, their mom called them almost at the last minute. Mr. Moser had been out of town, uh, had been over in London. And uh, so the kids went off to get their pajamas off and get ready to go. And there was a lot of mail that had stacked up. So he started going through the mail. And the first thing he took was this package that had a San Francisco return address on it. And uh, his wife heard this terrible, terrible noise. And by the time she got down towards the kitchen, there was smoke everywhere. And uh, this bomb was so powerful in this video cassette type of uh, container that, and it had shrapnel just as Gary's bomb did. But when it went off, they had those uh, uh, copper skillets above the stove hanging on a rack. And um, it actually went through, some of this shrapnel went through some of those really thick skillets. Uh, that was the power of this blast. And Mr. Moser was killed uh, as well, almost instantly, just as Mr. Ha uh, Scrutton had been in 1985. Uh, finally, uh, in April, April 24th, of 1995, again, right here in Sacramento uh, at the California Forestry Association. A bomb had been sent in the mail, actually addressed to Mr. William Dennison, who was the president of the CFA. But he'd left, and uh, he had been replaced by uh, Mr. Gilbert Murray. And Mr. Murray was going to, I guess, take this package up to Mr. Dennison up in Northern California, but uh, went ahead to open it to see what was in it, since it was addressed to the CFA as well. And again, the same kind of bomb, the same kind of bomb that Mr. Moser uh, received with all the power and all the destructive power and um, uh, just had no chance as he was sitting at his desk and opened that package. Can you talk a little bit about what the Unabomber was doing to avoid detection? I can. Uh, at the time, of course, we realized we were after somebody that knew a lot and uh, was uh, certainly too smart to leave a trail for himself. We had no idea how smart he was. Turns out Theodore Kaczynski was a genius. But uh, he went to a great deal of work and effort to make sure he didn't leave a trail behind. For example, all these bombs, they were all handmade. Gary mentioned seeing something shiny that looked like maybe a chrome nail. Probably was something that was fashioned from chrome on an old junked car up in back of Kaczynski's cabin. He would... He would start with the bombs, and he would build them all from scratch. 
So normally when we try to trace things back from a bombing crime scene forensically, uh, in this case, we couldn't trace many of these things back to anything. Uh, he would take casings off of batteries, so you couldn't go back to the batch number or find out where a battery had been bought or something like that. Uh, so it started with his bomb. He took sandpaper and sanded all of his devices very, very carefully to make sure that when those bombs were placed in the mail, they didn't have any of his fingerprints on them. He wore gloves when he was carefully putting these bombs together. In one instance, he actually went to the men's room at the bus station in Missoula, Montana. He got down on the floor and he gathered hair from the floor of the bathroom. And he took that hair back and then he started putting it in between layers of tape on some of the future bombs he built. He would later write that I did this because if the FBI found hair at a crime scene, they would think the hair came from the person who built the bomb. But really, it was just something I found at the bathroom. When he would go out to buy things like old pieces of pipe or anything he might use to create a bomb, he would disguise himself. In one instance, he reports or talks about when he's writing, uh, going to a junk store in uh, Salt Lake City. And he had stuffed his nose with uh, cotton and uh, he had trimmed his hair, he had dyed it black, and then he had on these really weird glasses uh, that he'd, he'd put on, and he went in there and uh, he figured, hey, if anybody sees me, they're certainly not gonna recognize me the way I look today. And uh, he did all these things in an effort to make sure he concealed his identity and uh, helped him later if we started looking at him seriously as a suspect. There was a famous composite picture of the Unabomber that was circulated and everybody was familiar with that. How did that come about? Well, Gary was part of a major turning point in what we call Unabom history. And uh, that is, on February 20th, 1987, you all saw the Unabomber. Tammy yeah. Fluey, who worked inside CAMS, was literally looking out the window four feet from where he was kneeling on the ground to arm the bomb that you would eventually come across. And uh, she noticed right away something was wrong. And so she's calling your dad, calling uh, Mr. Wright, and uh, she's watching all this. She's watching, literally, Theodore Kaczynski uh, set this bomb in motion for when somebody walks along. And then uh, her attention is taken off of him, and, uh, and then he leaves. He walks around the corner of the building, he's gone, and then almost immediately, you just happen to pull in yeah. at that point. But she described him, and this was the first time we knew that the Unabomber could say for sure, it really appears the Unabomber certainly is a male, because we kept getting that question. I mean, are you sure it's a male? And you're sure it's one person and all these kinds of things. But she described him very, very well, and this becomes also one of the more embarrassing parts of this case for us. Uh, this, of course, happened in 1987, and uh, she described this man perfectly, and um, subsequently a composite was put together. And that composite was distributed between 1987 and the time of our task force in 1994. But Tammy was never happy with that composite. And so something dramatic had happened here in the Bay Area during that time frame. Uh, you're familiar with the case of Richard Allen Davis and the kidnapping and murder of Polly Class. Well, if you've seen the picture of the actual photograph of Richard Allen Davis, and you've seen a, dis a uh, composite put together by Jeannie Boylan, who was an artist, a police artist, uh, after the fact, you see the similarity in these two, uh, the composite and the, the photograph. So we started thinking as we were looking for different ideas and different things to apply to Unibom, why don't we go back and redo the composite, and why don't we use Jeannie Boylan? And so uh, Max Knoll, who was our, uh, one of our case agents and supervisors on Unibom, actually got on the plane and flew out and met Tammy and uh, her, uh, her young daughter was there. And, uh, and uh, Jeannie Boylan was gonna sit down with Tammy and go through the painstaking detail of putting together this, putting together this new composite that we ultimately uh, distributed. And um, Max likes to make sure people know that you think that an FBI agent doing something like this has, has a really glamorous life. While Jeannie Boylan and um, and Tamara, Tamara Fluey were in the, uh, the other room doing the composite, Max was trying to entertain the kids and watch multiple showings of The Lion King to keep them really busy. But uh, it turned out that that composite, the gray hooded sweatshirt, the aviator sunglasses, we got that out in 1994, and uh, we, we put it out with a message. By this time, we were also telling the public, Think of Unibom and think of four devices in, in the 1978 to 1980 period in the Chicago area. Then think of uh, 
the middle of, of uh, between 1981 and 1982 in Salt Lake City, think of two bombings at Quarry Hall in Berkeley and from about 82 on, think of a nexus with the Bay Area and look at this composite. Those are the things we were dealing with as we were trying to bring the public into this big mystery. And um, we had one other small detail. Uh, the original composite, because you can't think of everything and please everybody all the time. The original composite, the artist's mother got really mad that we pulled that and put out, put out a new one. <laughs> so we, we got a number of uh, calls that she was very, very upset that, and, and very disappointed that we do that. So you never know what you're going to get on the next phone call, but uh, those are some of the things that happened along the way. The real break came when you received the manifesto. Can you tell us about that? We wanted the piece that would bring all this together, and we would have pulled out most of our hair to do it. In fact, I think I did. <laughs> and um, finally, uh, the Unabomber, uh, after the uh, murder of Mr. Murray, we uh, also keep in mind April 24th, 1995, just days earlier, we'd had the bombing of the Merle Federal Building in Oklahoma. So all of this is on the news, and what do we get? We get letters flooding out from the Unabomber to the New York Times, Penthouse, uh, all kinds of different places, the Washington Post, and to us uh, indirectly, uh, that the Unabom uh, group, which he called the terrorist organization FC, is preparing a manifesto. And uh, they want that manifesto to uh, be published. And we'll eventually get a copy if we agree to their terms. And um, so the idea was that the New York Times would publish the manifesto, uh, possibly the Washington Post. But if they didn't publish this manifesto, that again, we hadn't seen yet in uh, April of 95, uh, we would end up uh, seeing more bombings. And yet if they published it, uh, the terrorist group FC would desist from any more bombings. So in September of 1995, we actually get two things happening. One is the San Francisco Chronicle gets a letter one afternoon saying, this is the terrorist group FC, I put a bomb on an airliner out of LAX. Of course, that spun us all up, and, and everybody's command post is lit up everywhere, and we're trying to figure out how to deal with this. The next day, the manifesto starts flooding into these various places. Seven people got copies of it, and uh, it was accompanied by a short letter that said, hey, just one last joke from the terrorist group FC. Uh, here's the manifesto. And um, so once we got it and started reading it, and we had our profiler, Kathleen Puckett, really dive into this. Uh, it did two good things. One is it really, for some of us, seemed to be the piece that could really bring this all together. For many people, they thought it might be a red herring, that this has no relevance to this case at all. So we had to decide how we were going to deal with it and how we were going to fit it into this, but we also had to decide something else, and we, this became our biggest decision. What kind of recommendation are we going to make to the Attorney General, Janet Reno, and to the FBI Director, Louis Free? Because essentially what we're doing here, no matter what way we go, if we decide to recommend that you publish or that the Post and the Times publish the manifesto, the big thing was, are we giving in to terrorism? Are we basically involved in an extortionate transaction with a terrorist? And isn't it against US government policy to negotiate with terrorists and to give in to extortion? That was the big issue that kind of permeated our entire thinking between uh, the time we got the manifesto in September, or in, uh, in April, and the time that it was published in September. And ultimately, you decided that it would be published. Yes, we did. That what was considerations went into that? Well, we, uh, we threw this around, and uh, we came to a, a conclusion. And there were about six of us, Jim Freeman, the special agent in charge of the uh, San Francisco office, Max Knoll, who eventually would put together the arrest plan for the Unabomber, Kathy Puckett, who I've mentioned, and uh, myself. And um, we, we threw this around back and forth and uh, went into another room and decided, OK, uh, our recommendation should be that we don't publish it, that we don't recommend publication. So we took off to write up how we were going to write this and present it to the attorney general and FBI director. And we all started looking at each other. We had uh, Tony Moliat in there with us, who is actually a Sacramento resident, US Postal Inspector, was on our task force. We all look at each other, and, and it's like quiet. We, we decide we made the wrong decision in there with the special agent in charge. Uh, so we had to go back in, or I had to go back in, and say, I've got some news here. We think we ought to change our minds. And uh, so we had the discussion all over again. 
And for one primary reason, uh, we felt that publication was the way to go. And that is, it was our missing piece. It was so detailed, 35,000 words, so passionate and so specific that we felt it represented the lifelong thinking of the person we were looking for. And that if we could take this piece now and put it with those two other pieces, the composite, the geographical kind of sequencing, and then read the manifesto, put it all together and call us if you know anyone like this. That's what we sold to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the AG, and the FBI director. That's what they decided to do. And uh, the uh, manifesto was published on September 19th. And between September 19th and um, April 3rd, or actually the middle of February of, uh, of 96, we received over 55,000 phone calls on the uh, Unibom tip line. Uh, we had uh, wives wanting to turn in their husbands. <laughs> we had girlfriends gladly wanting to turn in their, uh, boyf their, uh, their boyfriends. And uh, yet none of those people were the Unabomber until that call in the middle of February from a fellow named David Basegli. And uh, he represent, I mean, uh, Tony Basegli in Washington, D.C. And he was representing, an, at, the t at the time, an unknown client. And uh, they wanted to talk to us about uh, some information that the client had. Steve, you were in the U.S. Attorney's Office all this time. I was. When, when did you become involved in the uh, Unabomber investigation? <clears throat> um, I became involved in April of 1993. And I had just finished a um, fairly prominent arson trial with ATF. And I, I was very much um, associated with ATF at the time doing a lot of their cases. And an agent named Greg Barnett brought me this case that uh, had long been dormant. The Unabomber hadn't been heard from in about six years at that point. And he said, here, take a look at this. And um, so the reason, reason he brought that to me was because there's typically a five-year statute of limitations on uh, all federal offenses. Uh, the statute, we had had 12 bombings up to this point. The statute of limitations had run on all 12 of those bombs with the exception of one. Uh, there's no statute of limitations on uh, capital murder cases. So Hugh Scrutton was killed in Sacramento in 1995. That was the one um, case that was still subject to any kind of federal jurisdiction. And, and the venue was appropriate in Sacramento. So the bottom line was, it was the only case where the case, only place where the case could be investigated. Did you start to work on the case at that time? I actually did. Uh, it seemed an important enough case. There, there were some working theories, not very good working theories, uh, about uh, who the Unabomber might be, uh, some of which had been de developed by ATF agents in Chicago. I wasn't aware at this point that there was such a thing as the Unibom Task Force. Um, and so I, I dived into the case and started mastering the facts. Did you eventually uh, get involved with the task force? <clears throat> yes, it was actually very shortly after that, I'd say within four to six weeks after that, that I started attending task force meetings. And I think Terry may, may have a better, well, you weren't there at that point. But very shortly after that, June of, 1993, we heard from the Unabomber again. Uh, he mailed two bombs from Sacramento. One went to a Yale University professor in New Haven, and the other one went to a professor at uh, UC San Francisco in Tiburon. Uh, so now we're off and running again. We've now heard from the Unabomber again. Were you on the task force at the time that the uh, decision was made to published the manifesto? Yes. Did you participate in that decision? I, I don't recall. I mean, I, we informally, yes. Uh, the decision was made essentially by the um, FBI, but there were um, several discussions we had. And by we, I mean Steve Fichero, um, an AUSA from uh, the Northern District, was on the task force at the, at the time. And we were, as I recall, I, w I was certainly very strongly in favor of publishing, and I think Steve was also. It was basically a 35,000 word writing sample. How did you learn about uh, David Kaczynski and his uh, involvement? Um, we, um, I think Terry 
or Max probably uh, notified me that we had been contacted by an attorney, Tony Basegli. And Terry, if, if I'm not mistaken, that occurred in the fall of The contact was 95. in February of 90, uh, with Tony Basegli was in uh, February of 96. Well, that's when we put agents in Montana. Right, it was just, it, it all happened very fast. Right. It was about, it was February 15th when we first heard from them. So it's interesting how you compress time, but, um, because I had remembered it as, as occurring earlier than that, but the bottom line is um, we were contacted by Tony Basegli, and he recounted how he had a client, he was representing the client anonymously at that point, uh, who believed he knew who the Unabomber was. Uh, he, this client had hired a private investigator to check it out. The private investigator had come back with the uh, conclusion that there was a 60% chance that Ted Kaczynski was the Unabomber. And with that information, David Kaczynski authorized Tony Basegli to go to the Department of Justice, relate his information. Uh, and it came with a price. The David Kaczynski was asking that in return for divulging who this individual was, he wanted the Department of Justice to uh, forego seeking the death penalty. Did they do that? No, the Department of Justice rejected that offer. But nevertheless, did you receive information from David Kaczynski? Yes, um, he came forward, he gave us the information. And I think um, one of the reasons he did is if you, if you look at um, some of the diaries and journals for Kaczynski, he, he had been estranged from David for quite some time, um, but he reached out to David uncharacteristically in 19, uh, I think initially in 1994, asked for a $1,000 loan. And David, being a compassionate person, uh, of course, agreed instantly, uh, sent Ted the money, thought Ted was probably uh, in declining health, maybe he needed it for that. Um, later, um, Ted is back asking for another loan from David, this time $2,000. David once again gave the money. And then when David started feeling that his brother might be the Unabomber, he started connecting the dots and came to believe that um, his loans to his brother had actually financed the last two murders, bombs 15 and 16. And that actually turned out to be correct. And I think out of just that sheer knowledge, David understood that he couldn't sit on this information and he, he divulged it. Along with the other information he divulged, you learned where Ted Kaczynski was living? Yes. Now, uh, how was the decision made to get a search warrant for that cabin? Um, we had had a search warrant in various stages of preparation all along because it was a very a massive search warrant. And there was a lot of information we could include in the warrant before we even know, knew who the Unabomber was. You have to put in information about each one of the 16 devices, uh, including the, the various components of the devices so that you know what you're searching for when you execute the warrant. Uh, you have to put in the basic facts that connect all the 16 devices. So a lot of that was already done. By your team? Who, who, who did that? By various members of the, the team. Steve Fichero took the lead on that. And in the final preparation, when uh, we knew who the warrant was going to be executed against, uh, Steve Fuchero, Max, Terry, and, and probably others in a couple of 24-inch uh, pizzas um, spent an all-nighter um, drafting the final version of the warrant and faxed it off to uh, District of Montana in the early morning hours. So a judge in the District of Montana issued the warrant? Correct. And uh, what did you learn when the warrant was executed? Well, you're asking about the search, yes. the results of the search. The search um, lasted over nine days, and, and people wonder, why does it take nine days to search a 10 by 12 foot cabin? The, the working assumption was that when we went into this place, it would be a bomb factory. And uh, protocols were in place to x-ray everything in place before they're moved. Um, and in fact, on 
day two of the search, we, we found a fully functional uh, bomb under Ted Kaczynski's bed. Um, and so that everything stopped at that point. We got a, uh, a tractor, what do you call them? We had a uh, bomb disposal. We had a particular piece of equipment that had been designed for San, by Sandia National Lab that was geared to Unibomb devices because Unibomb devices had uh, multiple triggering devices. So this was ready and was flown up from Riverside, California and deployed to bring the, uh, the bomb out of the cabin. So everything comes to a screeching halt at that point. The agents are cleared out of the cabin and the bomb is, is removed. Um, the, the search continues and, and basically what we found are, are some broad categories of evidence uh, about 40,000 pages of Kaczynski's writings, which included admissions to uh, almost all of his bombs, if not all. Um, we found uh, diary entries uh, that explained his motivations for killing. We found um, experiment binders containing 240 experiments that uh, Kaczynski had done over the years trying to perfect his bomb making uh, techniques. We found physical um, items in the cabin um, relating back to bombs, unibomb bombs. In particular, there was a very specific signature piece of Kaczynski's bombs, which we call the flip switch. It was the mechanism that basically completes the electrical circuit, brings two pieces of metal together to complete the electrical circuit to detonate the, the bomb. Very um, uh, unusual design characteristic of unibomb devices. The flip switch itself was made of uh, a piece of wood, uh, hickory, I think, that was fashioned probably out of an axe handle or a, a hammer handle. Uh, we found an oatmeal canister that contained, I think, 17 of those flip switches. Um, and they were virtually, you put them side by side, they're virtually identical to ones that uh, we found in Unibomb devices. One of the most important pieces of evidence we found um, that we all said if we, we want anything in the world, this is the thing we want. Um, a uh, L.C. Smith Corona typewriter. Since 1982, the Unibomber had used an L.C. Smith Corona uh, typewriter that the FBI lab estimated had been manufactured in 1934, 1935 with 2.54 spacing, which is the centimeters between the letters. We were looking for a very specific uh, object. This is the typewriter that the Unabomber had used to not only type the manifesto, but to type everything from envelopes uh, that accompanied his bombs to uh, Terry uh, talked about the letter that preceded the Percy Wood device. That letter was typed um, on this typewriter. If we found that typewriter, that would connect uh, Kaczynski to all of the, the devices. Um, we found one old typewriter in the cabin. Experts took a look at it, wasn't the one. Found a second one, not the one, according to the experts. On the, on the last day of the search, um, we found in a um, ammo canister, ammo box, ammo box. Uh, L.C. Smith Corona typewriter man manufactured in approximately 1935 with 2.54 spacing. That was the typewriter. So I take it with all the information you found, uh, you had no doubt that you would be able to prove a case against Ted Kaczynski. We, we felt that you could parse out the evidence 10 different ways and convict Ted 10 different times. It was not a case that we thought was lacking in proof. The decision to prosecute in this district is interesting. Can you tell us how that came about and, and why the decision was ultimately made to prosecute the case here? So, so I indicated previously that the statute of limitations is five years for most federal offenses. By the time we got to 1996, when the Unabomber is captured, we have a valid statute of limitations on only five devices. Three murders and then the devices in... Um, 1993 that were mailed from Sacramento that went to separate uh, parts of the country. So as of 1996, 
Sacramento, the Eastern District of California, had venue over four of the five devices. Two of them because the bombs had gone off here, two of them because the bombs had been mailed here. The only device uh, that we didn't have venue over was the one that was sent from uh, San Francisco to New Jersey. Um, and that was separately indicted in New Jersey. Who actually made the decision to prosecute here? Uh, Attorney General Reno <clears throat> was the one who ultimately made the decision. We went back to Washington, D.C. and made a presentation to her. Um, and by we, I mean uh, Steve Ruchero was part of that discussion from San Francisco. I believe Bob Cleary from New Jersey, the first assistant from New Jersey, was there. And we basically laid out the case for her, the competing concerns, where the case should be prosecuted. Was there any disagreement? There wasn't. Um, there was actually quite a bit of harmony here. It was an easy decision to make for the reasons I've stated. Um, we had the choice of prosecuting the case in two locales or four, um, with, with four of them being in one location. So it, it was really, from a, a lawyer's standpoint, a pretty easy decision to make. How was the decision made whether to seek the death penalty? The, that was made through uh, the Department of Justice's normal um, operating protocols. There's a death penalty review committee that is convened in all cases where the U.S. attorney wants to seek the death penalty. That committee is composed of um, high-level Department of Justice officials. The um, prosecution uh, is required to submit a package to that death penalty committee set, setting forth all the information you would expect, the basic facts of the case, the aggravating and mitigating factors that would warrant uh, seeking the death penalty, of course, the statutory basis for seeking the death penalty, such as um, the laying in wait or um, deliberation, planning, things like that. Uh, the defense is also um, invited to make their submission, um, stating whatever mitigating factors they believe. And in this particular case, uh, David Kaczynski was invited to participate in the Death Penalty Review Committee. And what position did he take? Uh, surprisingly, he was uh, asking for his brother to be saved, uh, spared the death penalty. He... Um, his position, I think, as I recall, was twofold. He he basically said, "Look, in his view, these crimes had been motivated by his brother's mental illness, and not by um, true criminal behavior." And he also made a pitch that if the Department of Justice sought the death penalty, the blood would really be on his hands, David's hands, because David had come forward provided the information necessary to find his brother. And David felt um, a great deal of the responsibility, as any brother would. Quinn Denver, were you actually the federal defender for this district when Ted Kaczynski was arrested? No, I, I had been uh, selected, but had not yet taken the office. And how did you learn that uh, he had been arrested? I'm sure I picked up the Sacramento Bee and read about it. <laughs> <laughs> now. Uh, did you take any steps to be appointed uh, to represent him even though you were not actually the federal defender yet? Yeah, I, I, uh, I contacted the federal defender, uh, Ruth and Beck, and told him that uh, I would like to be appointed under the Criminal Justice Act to, to represent Ted since he had been arrested. Even though he had not been brought to this district, we didn't know whether he was coming to this district or not. And he approached the court, and I was appointed and took it up from there. What were your thought processes in making the decision to ask to be appointed to represent him yourself? Well, uh, I felt that if the case did come to, to Sacramento, that the Federal Defender's Office should take the lead on it. Uh, there had been a case a couple of years earlier, the Oklahoma City bombing, where the, the local office had deferred and had private attorneys uh, handle the case. I had been a uh, county public defender, the state public defender. I was now going to be the federal public defender. I kind of thought public defender offices should do the, the hardest cases, the biggest cases, and thought that our office should take care of it. 
Did you uh, go back to Montana to interview uh, Ted Kaczynski? There was an early meeting where, when it was unclear where this case would be brought, where the uh, the federal defender from from uh, San Francisco, the federal defender from New Jersey, uh, federal defender up from Montana, and myself all met together there to kind of talk about where things might go and things of that nature. And we actually met with Ted at that point for a short time period. Did you participate in the proceedings to determine whether the government would seek the death penalty? We did. Uh, the, the, uh, the question of whether the, the government would seek the death penalty was, was not decided at the time of the arrest or the time of uh, when it was decided where it would be prosecuted. It was months beyond that. The, the Department of Justice allows the, the, uh, the defense time to put together a case for mitigation and we t took advantage of that for some amount of time and, and went back and presented that case to, to, uh, to this Capital Review Committee or whatever it was called. I should say that one, one David Kaczynski made two other points why there should not be a death penalty. One was he said, if you execute my brother after I was the one that brought him in, no one will ever bring anybody in again. And the second thing he said is that Steve is right, I, I guess, because I wasn't there, that, that when Tony Basegli first approached the, uh, the government about an agreement, no death penalty if, if David would cooperate, uh, they, that was turned down. But, but David said that, that later he was told during the course of this or somewhere in there that uh, it would be a good thing for, for there to, to be a, uh, to, for Ted to, to be arrested and brought in because he would not do other uh, damage, which I think really, really worried David more than maybe guilt about he had helped on two earlier ones. He was afraid that he had information about who, who was doing this and the person might continue to do it. But he also was told something to the effect of, and, and, and it'll be better off for him. And he, he took that to mean that there would be some consideration, I, th there was an agreement. So that, that he made a presentation, uh, we made a presentation. The, uh, all cases where the death penalty is even possible goes to that committee with a recommendation from the local U.S. attorney one way or another. This one, there's a recommendation, recommendation for it. The committee uh, recommended that Attorney General Reno approve the authorization of the death penalty, and that's what happened. What steps did you take to put together a defense team uh, after you learned the government was going to seek the death penalty? Well, we, we put the, the, the defense team together as soon as we found out the case was coming here. We didn't, we, I wanted people to be involved in this presentation of the mitigation to the Capital Review Committee. Um, I knew we needed, I, I felt that in the office I was the one that was the most qualified to, to, to be the lead counsel, though I had had not tried a capital case. I'd been involved in a number of capital cases in various uh, 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 various roles. And I wanted to get another attorney to be so we would have two of us working together. Um, I felt again that I, we should look within the federal defender system for the, for the second attorney. There wasn't a need to go out to, the, you know, we had the resources there. I had um, several, three, four, six months earlier been at a death penalty conference down in Houston and one of the people there was Judy Clark, uh, who at that time was the, the federal defender for Eastern Washington and Idaho. And uh, she'd taken part in this. I was quite impressed with what she, what she said and everything. We later went out to the airport together. We had a couple of beers together. We flew to Denver together, and we didn't see each other again. And I knew she was very well re re thought of uh, both for her trial work and for her legal skills, and uh, she had recently handled her first capital case. She had gone back on her own time, taking a leave of absence from her job, to uh, co-counsel a case in South Carolina, I believe, or North Carolina, Susan Smith case, a, a woman who had driven a car into a lake and the, and the children had died. She had done that with David Bruck, who's one of the best death penalty uh, defense attorneys in the country. And, so I knew she had that experience. I approached her. I knew she was a tireless worker, uh, literally tireless. Um, I'm not tireless. <laughs> and so I approached her, and she said she'd be willing to do it. Who else was on the team? Well, we wanted, we wanted someone to, we wanted an attorney to take over the role of, of developing the, uh, the mitigation themes. In a, in a, in a normal case, a non-capital case, you have a trial where the only question is, did he do it and what did he do? 
and then it goes to a judge to, to hear evidence or something along those lines to, to make a decision as to what the sentence would be. In a capital case, you have a separate penalty phase where the same jury who decided guilt will then decide the penalty. Penalty here was going to be either the death penalty or life without possibility of release. That's actually the federal phrase, not parole. Um, and what had developed over time in the, in the capital defense uh, community was, was the idea that the, go the government is going to have the whole guilt phase focused on the offense, and they're going to prove the offense and who, and who did it. And then you're going to shift over, and the jury's going to know all about that. Then you're going to shift over to the penalty phase, where the defense has to bring a focus on the offender, the person who's been convicted of the crime, and, and to present to the jury every possible theme, fact, prediction, hope, as a reason why they would say, we could let this person live and die in prison rather than being executed by the government. And, and there are a number of people who have worked in those areas, have a lot of experience in those areas. And one of them was a, was a lawyer by the name of Gary Sowards, who was in San Francisco. He had formerly been with the California Appellate Project. And we asked him to come on as the mitigation attorney. Then he, there's also a, there are these specialized investigators who have a lot of experiences. I mean, we've had a lot of death penalty cases in this country. A lot of people learn a lot. And they, they become basically what we call mitigation specialists. They're really investigators who, who specialize in, in presenting these mitigation themes. First of all, searching everywhere about the person's background, everything you can, to, to then to, to find the themes that you can present to the jury. And one of, one of the, the best and probably the one who started that, that whole uh, craft was, was a woman by the name of Charlotte Holdman. She also was in San Francisco. So we hired her and then, uh, and then in order, they needed people then to go out to talk to everybody you ever knew, Ted, go up to Lincoln, go to, go to, yeah, go to uh, Harvard, go to Michigan, Berkeley, everything. Talk to everybody you can to find out more about the person that you can then present to, to the jury so they'll see who this person is, not just the offender. Because one of, one of the themes is, uh, in these cases for the defense is, no one is the worst thing they've done. There's always more to it. And, th and that's true of every person on the jury. It's true of everybody. You're, you're never only the worst thing you've ever done. There's always more to it, and you want to show that here. And so uh, we, uh, rather, we decided then to, to we, we, uh, retain some college or law students who took time off, and they worked under Charlotte as, as, as being the kind of the people on the ground going out and talking to everybody and writing reports. Steve, you also had a team. Who was on your team? Um, <clears throat> Bob Cleary was the head of the team. He was uh, the first assistant in New Jersey. Um, Steve Ricciaro had been on the Unibom task force for quite some time at that point. He was uh, from the Northern District of California. And, <clears throat> and then I represented the Eastern District. So basically, we had um, assistant US attorneys from the three involved districts. We also had a very able prosecutor from Montana, Bernie Hubley, um, and uh, an extremely able uh, writer, uh, an uh, assistant U.S. attorney named Douglas Wilson, who came on to ba basically be our brief writer because we knew this is a case that was going to involve a lot of briefing on a lot of different issues. Wouldn't be brief. Speaking brief. of briefing, Quinn, it sounds like there was a lot of evidence uh, uh, obtained as a result of that search. Uh, did you make any effort to uh, uh, quash that search for any well, reason? Well, we, we did. I mean, one, one of the jobs of a defense attorney is, is to look at search warrants and see whether they, you think that they are, uh, are lawful, and if they're not, whether the evidence that's seized pursuant to the warrant can be suppressed. And, and we, uh, we looked at that search warrant affidavit, actually, about 100 pages, I recall. And, and, the, and the, uh, the FBI was, was hustling at, to put that affidavit together, with good reason, because they were afraid there might be another crime. And they compiled a lot of things, but we felt that in the end, it, it wasn't sufficient. Um, you, you have to understand that, the, that basically, until David Kaczynski through Tony Biseglia, uh contacted the FBI, 
No one in the government had ever heard of Ted Kaczynski. He was, an, he was not on the radar. In fact, later on, they found his name in a, in a big data bank of people who graduated from the University of Michigan. So, so when, when David then came in and said he thought his brother could be, and I, I don't think he ever said he was, but I think he thought he could be, he was really concerned about this for reasons that both Steve and I have explained, he gave the information. Then the, the, uh, the government put a lot of folks out working very, uh, very hard to put together the search warrant. We felt that, that it didn't show probable cause to believe the facts in there were not sufficient to show probable cause that Ted Kaczynski was a Unabomber. Uh, we filed a motion to suppress. Um, government responded. We replied. Uh, it went to, to Judge Burrell, and Judge Burrell felt that there was sufficient uh, probable cause. I have to say two things about that. One is, um, I'm convinced to this day that if they'd gone into that cabin and found nothing about the Unabomber, but found a pound of marijuana and charged him with marijuana, they we would have had the, 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 the warrant thrown out. But there's something that just is a matter of reality. It's very, though, I believe in the law, and I believe the law has got to go where it's got to go and where it's going to be driven. There is something that's very kind of counterintuitive to say that these facts don't show probable cause that he is the Unabomber when inside the cabin after the search, there's endless evidence that he was. I mean, it's just, I think, <laughs> I think that's kind of a head change that would be very hard to make. D but, did you but, just argue that there was not probable cause, or did you present some evidence to the court to persuade the judge that there judge, was not probable cause? we always cause? present evidence. We don't present uh, just an uh, arguing. You know that. Tell us about it. No, we, we, we went through every bit, everything that was, every fact that was stated in there, other than the, the nature of the crimes that they were linked together, which was irrelevant to the question about whether there's probable cause to believe Ted was there. And, and try to show that, it, that it, it didn't have the significance that they attributed to it. Um, and part of, one of the big things that was done, there was a large, there was a, a substantial part of the affidavit was, was devoted to the Unabomber Manifesto. And a number, there was a, a detailed analysis of it, uh, trying to show uh, that words in there uh, and concepts in there were, could be attributed to Ted Kaczynski. And we went through and tried to show why that was not true. One of, one of the most striking, I think, was the Unibom uh, Manifesto said, um, you can't, I always get this wrong, you can't have your cake no, and eat it too. No, you can't it's the other eat way your cake and have it too. <laughs> no, it's, we, we always say, what, the normal way we say is you can't eat your cake and have it too. That's the no. normal one, right? No, <laughs> no. Ted Kaczynski has you convinced. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm trying to remember what, what, what the phraseology. You, you can't eat your cake and have it too. You can have your cake and eat it too. You got it backwards. No. And the interesting thing is, and, 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 we, and we hired a linguist to go through and look at everything that was in there. And, but one of the things interesting about that is the phrase you can't have your cake and eat it too, which is, is really literally correct, you know. You can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, is the correct one. It also goes back to the Bible from the, from the book of Proverbs, and it's been used for, for, in literature and a number of different places. So it was not some unusual phrase that only Ted Kaczynski ever used, though the, the, uh, the affidavit did point out he had used that phrase in a letter to his mother, so it was not foreign to him. But it wasn't like this, this curious phrase that, that, gee, he's the only guy who's ever said that. He must have done this. And then, and then we went through all the rest of it. They made a big point of the fact that uh, the, the manifesto spelled installment with one L instead of two Ls. And, and our linguist said that's a very common thing. They, they, the number of times certain words were used, the linguist said that that didn't mean anything if you looked at it. And, and then we point out things that, that, that uh, cut the other way. For instance, the, as I recall, Ted split his infinitives and the, and the manifesto didn't, or vice versa. So there, we, we put on a, a, a lot of that. And then, and then there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of facts co uh, co connected, uh, collected about his, his movements. And we tried to explain that none of them ever were linked to any particular of the bombs. But there was, there, you have 100 pages of which probably 80 pages are facts that are supposed to show the probable cause. And we try to take those on across the board. Given the court's ruling denying your motion to suppress, 
What was your trial strategy? Well, I, I mean, it, it was clear that, that if we didn't win the motion to suppress and the evidence from the, from the cabin came in, that there would be a guilty verdict. I mean, that, I mean Steve's giving you a little bit of, of what that would, would have, what it was. I mean, Ted had, had written thousands of pages of journals and he discussed this. They were, you know, all the stuff that Steve's talked about. So the, the, it was clear that he was going to be convicted. The only question then was what would the penalty be and would it be life or death, basically. And so our, our, uh, our, our goal from, from then on was to, having lost the, the suppression motion that might have changed the whole guilt question. In fact, it would have eliminated a guilt trial because there wasn't enough evidence without that. Um, then we had to start dealing with the question of what the penalty would be when the jury d did convict him. Steve, what was your trial strategy? To win. <laughs> um, we, we knew, um, you know, that there were two cases going on at this time that were, it was catching national prominence, the Oklahoma City bombing case and ours. And I, I kind of viewed those as the flip side of the coin. In, in Oklahoma City, I thought they might have a difficult time proving guilt, but once they prove that, who's not going to give the death penalty to someone who has killed 368 Americans? I viewed ours as the evidence was overwhelming. I had very little doubt that we were going to get a conviction, but we knew that uh, a mental defense was coming or, or probably would be coming and that that was going to be the battleground. So what did you do? to protect against that? Well, um, we, we prepared to meet the defense, uh, whether it came in the guilt phase or the, the um, penalty phase. We had um, amassed a lot of evidence with respect to Kaczynski's desire to kill, when that was formed, his lack of remorse, his struggling with his conscience uh, as to whether or not killing was uh, an appropriate way to go. And, and we felt that he was his own worst enemy. He had written so much on those subjects that we were just going to display that for the jury. Did you make any effort to get a mental examination of Ted Kaczynski? Well, we did. Um, that came up because the defense in June of 1997, the trial commenced in November of 97. In June of 97, the defense filed a motion um, setting forth their intention to put forth a mental defense, short of insanity. That triggers certain rights on behalf of the prosecution. We can seek to have our experts then do a psychiatric examination of the defendant. Did you ever get that examination? We did not. Yeah. Uh, we spent the better part of the summer briefing that issue back and forth, uh, issues like how many psychiatrists for the government are going to be able to do that, What's going to be the setting? Uh, what kind of questions can they ask? Um, that briefing continued throughout the summer and into the start of jury selection. We were still arguing about it um, when Kaczynski finally indicated he simply wasn't going to submit to a mental examination. Then the briefing switched from, well, what's the consequence of that refusal? And the government's position was there are all sorts of sanctions that could be imposed, including preventing him from uh, raising a mental defense or barring uh, expert testimony or variations on the theme. Quinn, the, uh, the notice that Steve has referred to was a 12.2B notice. Correct. Uh, why did you give such a notice of intent to use a, a, a mental defense? Well, first of all, let me just, I, I, I want to clarify something. That is, that is the a notice that you're going to present a mental defense through expert witnesses in in the guilt phase, or, or you're going to present that kind of evidence. And and it, it really recently been amended to say if you're going to rely on your experts who've talked to to the defendant, then the prosecution has a right to have someone talk to him too. And that, so that was the setting for that. Um, our our thought was that that. Uh, the jury was going to hear everything, as I say, about the offenses throughout the, throughout the guilt phase, which was going to be quite prolonged. I mean, the government was going all out with all their evidence, although I don't know they needed it all, but that's, that was going to be their decision. 
And then we were going to come in suddenly and say, oh, by the way, and here's Ted Kaczynski. You, you ought to know something about him. So we, we thought it was important that they get an early sense about who Ted was and his history and his mental illness. And so we wanted to present that evidence, not with any, any uh, hope that it, it would defeat the convictions, but that it would at least uh, introduce those, those kind of thoughts to the jury before we made a fuller presentation. Did you intend to call uh, experts uh, on his mental condition during the guilt phase? We originally did. And what changed your mind? Uh, what, really, what changed our mind, um, well, actually, what, 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 what changed our mind was, first of all, there was a point where, where Ted became very upset about that idea and, and, uh, and was very upset about it. And we had some conferences in, in, uh, in, uh, in camera with Judge Burrell and developed it a lot. And we finally, we finally agreed that we would not present those witnesses in the in the uh, in the guilt phase, expert witnesses, but but we kept open the fact that we uh, would present other witnesses and physical evidence like the cabin in the guilt phase and both expert and other evidence in the in the penalty phase. All right. Uh, so I, that's essentially where it was at the time. Let's get to the trial. Uh, how difficult was it to select a jury, Steve? The um, <clears throat> we called in about. 600 people in the jury pool uh, for the reason that there wasn't anybody who wasn't going to know about this case. And so they filled out about a 100-page questionnaire. And the, the procedure that uh, the judge had, had set up was to call six jurors in in the morning, six jurors in the afternoon. <clears throat> each side would be given approximately 15 minutes to voir dire um, each of the jurors so that that's a half an hour times six jurors. We, we get three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. Um, and uh, the jury has to be death qualified, so they have to be examined as to whether they have any serious objections to the death penalty um, um, and uh, things, things like that. Um, and it, it was obviously a challenge to find people who had not already formed an opinion about the case. Wasn't part of these proceedings actually conducted out at the state fairgrounds at Cal Expo? The initial 600-person uh, jury pool uh, was brought out to Cal Expo um, to fill out the questionnaires. How long did it take to actually get a panel? Um, I believe, uh, I just looked at this the other day. Um, to my surprise, it, it only took 16 days. <laughs> but that, that went from... Um, November, I think, 12th is when we started. We impaneled the jury a couple of days before Christmas. After you finally got a jury selected, did anything unusual happen? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Quinn has already referenced the fact that um, Ted had um, tried to fire his attorneys or express some dissatisfaction with uh, their pursuing a mental defense. Um, the, the trial was set to begin January 5th, and uh, the court had thought, I, I think justifiably, that he had brokered a deal with Kaczynski to keep the, the attorneys on if they would agree not to present a mental defense. And Quinn can tell the story better than I can, but Judy Clark apparently premiered her uh, opening statement to Kaczynski uh, the night before trial was set to commence, so January 4th, and uh, he was very upset, uh, allegedly, about um, her mentioning mental issues in, in her opening statement. Well, if Quinn can tell it better, let's yeah. hear it. Yeah, I, I, I'll deal with it allegedly, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> let, 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 me go, let me go back to jury selection, because I think there was very, one of the things very interesting about that was uh, the big question for us was not whether people thought uh, Ted was guilty or not. It was what, how could they keep an open mind on the two penalties. And so we spent a lot of time, both sides, a asking those questions. And early on, we, what Judge Burrell did, he, as, as Steve explains, we would have 15 minutes each for three jurors morning and that. And then, then we would get a transcript that night of, of, the, of the, uh, the voir dire, and then we could make challenges for cause the next day. And, and uh, so that we, 
we would deal with just kind of systematic like that, which I think was a very good way to do it. But it was early on in the voir dire, and I, and I, I think Judge Burrell does not remember this. I was sitting there, and we, we would voir dire some of these jurors, and we would say, now, do you believe that someone intentionally kills someone, they should get the death penalty? And they say, oh, yeah. You know, and we're like, okay. We got a cause problem here. The judge would say, as judges always do in this thing, to make sure that, that you understand what they're saying, would say, but if I told you that the law required you to consider both penalties, would you consider it? The jurors would all say, well, yeah. So there would go the cause challenge, potentially. I mean, depend the judge could, could look at it. But I had realized that, that the, the jurors are sitting about as far closer than we are right now, below Judge Burrell, who's, who's quite big, he's got a deep voice, and he would ask that question in a way that wasn't meant to intimidate them, but it was to impress them with what, you know, if I tell you this, you're going to do it. And I, I realized this, this is, we're gonna, this is not going to work. I mean, everybody's going to say, sure, Judge, whatever you say, I don't want to get in trouble. I'll follow the law, whatever it is. <laughs> and, we, and we want them to be honest about, well, where are you coming from on this? I mean, that's the key thing on so I had the uh, temerity or rashness to call, to say, Judge, could we approach you for a bench conference? And he said, fine, went up there. And I explained the problem as I saw it. And he said, well, I don't mean to intimidate him or you know, influence him. And I said, well, I understand that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it has the same effect. And then he said, well, how about if I came down to the lectern where the lawyers stand when I ask my questions? and ask the same questions, all that. And that's what he did for the rest of, of the selection. And uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's ever been done before. I thought, I thought in the end the jury selection went very well. I'm not sure I was happy with the jury, or Steve was, but I think given the pools and everything, it went very well. But, I, but I, I, that kind of stood out to me. I don't know if anybody's ever done it before, but it, it just changed the dynamics. You know, when, when he was over further away and everything, I think people felt more easier to kind of say what they were really thinking. All right, so now I don't know what. So that's my diversion. What's, what was your question? <laughs> okay. What happened when Judy Clark went over her opening statement with yeah. Ted Kaczynski? Well, you, you have to understand uh, first of all that, that that Ted is a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. He has written forever about um, the evils of the of mental health professionals and that what they do in the way of mind control. He. Uh, He's, he is a genius, and his, he, he kind of, his core is his mind and his brain and his thinking. And the idea that someone would say that he had mental health problems was anathema to him. It would be like stabbing him, right? So he was not, he didn't want that at all. I mean, that is not something in, in public to have that. And he also felt that it would denigrate from, from the, the ideas in the, in the manifesto, which I would recommend you read it's about 30 pages and it's really quite good and it's not violent it's not you know it's not like it is his views about what technology will do to our society some a lot better now than they did back in 97 or 96 and and also about mind control and those kinds of problems so so when when he had agreed to this this arrangement first of all the, the big thing that it came up early on was who makes the decision as to what a defense is put on when the person is represented by counsel? Our position was, it was clear you cannot, there are certain things that a, 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 a defendant with counsel decides for themselves. One of them is what plea to make. They also decide whether there would be an insanity plea because that in effect is, is the plea of guilty and by reason of insanity. One reason that was not raised here. Whether they'll take the stand whether they'll address the judge, there's four of them or five of them. Our position was that, and, and we thought the case law supported it was, other than that, it's, it's up to the, the attorneys to determine how to proceed in support of the not guilty plea. And, and we thought the law supported that, and, and I think it did, but it wasn't, it wasn't by the U.S. Supreme Court or something like that. Judge Burrell agreed on that. And so, so it was understood that, that as long as we were his lawyers, we would, we would decide what witnesses to call, what, you know, how to pick the jury, how to do all the things that lawyers do. So, so early on, then, the, there was this, this broker deal when he was upset again about the idea of his mental health coming in, that we would drop the experts from, from the guilt phase. 
Later on, we would have to drop the experts even from the uh, penalty phase because he refused to see a, uh, the government psychiatrist, and, and the sanction would have been we couldn't present our experts in either phase. The reason he didn't want to see the government uh, psychiatrist was he was afraid, hard to believe, that the government psychiatrist, Park Dietz, would find him mentally ill, his big fear. But in any case, he, he, he did not want us to put on that, that, that testimony about, and what we were gonna do is we were gonna try to explain his mental illness through other evidence, his lifestyle, where, where he had started from, where he had gone to, how he had ended up being a, you know, a, a whiz kid who skipped two years in, in high school, went to Harvard on a scholarship, got a PhD in no time from Michigan, and then ended up living in this cabin and in, in this kind of crazy life. In fact, we brought the cabin down from, from uh, Montana. We stored it out at, at the Air Force Base. We were gonna have the jury go see it. I mean, you, had, you could not imagine this, this uh, calling it a cabin sounds like it's gonna be an A-frame. This was, as Steve says, like a 10 by eight, two windows about that big, a big pot stove there, no running water, no toilet. I mean, it was, it was more like a cell than anything else. And for him to voluntarily go there, uh, we thought would, would help them understand his mental problems, which, which I think fed his, his schizophrenia. You know, you're sitting there in the dark in February in Montana from three until 10 in the morning, I, you know, with, with no electricity and everything. But we wanted to put that on. He, he did not want that. So there were some back and forth and back and forth on it uh, in meetings and attempts to... Uh, to, to see if there was some way we could fulfill our obligation to try to save his life, and he would be satisfied with that. And there was even talk about another attorney coming in. Uh, Kevin Climo, who was an experienced uh, defense attorney here, came in to counsel Ted and give him advice on, on this, independent of us, you know, where we were involved. And, and in the end, uh, he declared, after some backs and forths and everything that Steve was, <laughs> couldn't believe these things get, seemed like it was resolved, it's not resolved. He decided that he wanted to represent himself. He declared what they, uh, what they call a Feretta right. It's a case, Feretta versus California, that says you can, you can represent yourself in a criminal uh, trial. Do you want me to carry it from there, or do you want to stop at that point? For in, in context, uh, this takes place after the jury selection. Uh, Correct. And after he's had this discussion with Judy Clark, telling him what she plans to say in her opening statement. Right, that, that's what triggers his first concern and addressing the judge about it. There's some further proceedings. He seems to be mollified with some other changes that were made. He expresses his concern again. And then finally, I think maybe on the third time, he says, I want to represent myself. I'm asking to do it, which is the Feretta request. At that point, Judy and I uh, felt that we had to declare a reasonable doubt uh, about his competency to, to make that decision. And uh, and then when, usually if the lawyers declare that and there's some basis for it, and we certainly had no basis for it, then the judge will order an evaluation of the defendant and then will hold a competency hearing and decide for himself whether the person is competent or not. And that's what happened here. And what did Judge Burrell rule? Well, the, the first, first thing happened was he, he agreed that, that, that Ted had to be examined and evaluated for his competency. And the... Uh, it was agreed after some back and forth between the government and the defense that rather than send him off to some federal medical center, and because of the time problems with the jury coming in, we would ask to have someone come out and evaluate him. And the government arranged, or actually it may have been Judge Burrell, arranged for a Sal, a Dr. Sally Johnson, who was the chief of the, of, the, of the federal medical complex in Butner, South Carolina, and who had handled a lot of these cases, competency cases, including Hinckley and and other ones, to come out here, look into the case, read the, whatever she needed, talk to Ted, and make a decision as to his competency. And, and she, it must have taken four or five days. For, she got out here and did all that, and she heard from the government, she heard from us. She came back with a report that said that he was a paranoid schizophrenic, uh, but she did not feel that he was, un, because of that, he was unable to assist his lawyers in his defense. That's the standard for competency. And therefore, that he was competent to, uh, to make the decision to represent himself. Then the question was whether Judge Burrell would grant that motion, that Ferretta motion. 
and uh, the judge denied it on two grounds. One was that it was untimely because it should have been made before the jury had been impaneled. And secondly, that it was, it was being made for, for purposes of delay. Uh, I think that's the word. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and therefore said that you cannot represent yourself. You're going to stay with these attorneys. And then I can talk about what happened after that or if you want to see what Steve has to say. I would like to see what Steve has to say. What, what did uh, the government think of Judge Burrell's rulings on those uh, issues? Uh, the, this was a snake pit. This was terra incognita. We, we were dealing with issues that were very fact-bound, and the government was flying in the blind to a certain extent because a lot of these hearings had been conducted in camera, so um, as they should have been. And so we didn't know exactly what was taking place. Um, we were concerned about the, the Feretta issue because if anything is going to get you reversed, it's going to be an issue like Feretta, which involves a defendant's constitutional right. And um, we, we were concerned about the, the findings that it was for purposes of, of delay, bearing in mind that Kaczynski had first raised concerns as early as November 25th. Um, the judge very meticulously went back and looked at the jury selection proceedings and determined, pick, picked apart the record and determined that um, Kaczynski must have known at that early stage that um, uh, that a mental that there was a mental defense, and so that that was the basis for the judge's conclusion that um, his later request to represent himself, which which occurred. Uh, I think must have been six weeks later, was untimely, and that what he was presently engaged in was for purposes of delay. We didn't we didn't see it necessarily that way. Um, I I felt that Kaczynski, being a lay person, was wrapped up in issues that he was only gradually coming to understand, and and. Judge Burrell did address those issues mm -hmm. and the, whether or not a layperson um, would be expected to know how these things are unfolding. Um, so he was not unaware of the issue either. But from, from our standpoint, we were very concerned that that was a live issue. How, how did that issue or that concern uh, affect uh, your desire to continue to go ahead and seek the death penalty? Well, we, we were fully prepared to start trial on January 5th, and then afterwards, the next day, January 22nd, I think, when all the proceedings were finished, uh, we were fully prepared to go forward with the trial. We had had some uh, discussions with um, the defense in December, I believe it was, and they made some demands which we couldn't accede to. Um, so, so those discussions were cut off. Right. Uh, Quinn, what happened next? Well, I think you have to go back to what happened in December. I'm not sure the timing of it, but we, we, uh, we approached the, we, we went back to Washington again and presented further mitigation evidence to the, uh, to the Capital Review Committee, whatever they're called, asking them to, to, to remove the death penalty from the case, and they, and they declined to do so. We then approached uh, later in the fall, maybe December is right. We approached um, we approached the the local prosecutors, Steve and his team, to see if they would entertain a an offer to plead guilty and remove the death penalty with only with two conditions. One condition would be normally, if you plead guilty, you waive your right to to challenge rulings, like the suppression motion. We wanted to know, we wanted to be able to to preserve the right to appeal the suppression motion which there's a procedure for doing, but the government has agreed to it. And at the time, we wanted to know whether they would agree that he would not be sent to a mental institution um, and as opposed to any, any other place the Bureau of Prisons had under its control or Department of Justice, and, and they, and they uh, declined to do that. All right. So what happened uh, after the... Uh... Well, what happened afterward then is... Uh, 
so we're on but maybe the 22nd of January. Ted has been found been mentally ill but competent. He has also been denied his right to represent himself. So he, he has us as his lawyers. He knows what we're going to put on in terms of, of, uh, of evidence in order to try to save his life. And at that time, um, right after, actually right after Judge uh, Burrell's ruling, I approached the, the bench and said we wanted to plead guilty uh, to all the crimes here and New Jersey for no death penalty and without those other two conditions. And the government accepted that? We did. Did you have to consult with the Attorney General? We can, yes, we did, uh, and she gave her approval. What were some of the considerations? Uh, I had had some discussions with the Solicitor General in the, in the interim about the twin rulings that we'd been talking about, the, the denial of um, the Ferretta request and the, uh, the ruling that Kaczynski was not in charge of his own defense. We discussed that with the Solicitor, solicitor General. Um, we acknowledged that, that uh, there wasn't, wasn't very much case law on it and that we're dealing with really some very cutting edge issues. The Solicitor General um, indicated that he thought that there was litigation risk there, that uh, if, we had, if we went through with the entire trial, it's possible uh, it could be reversed. And uh, we communicated that fact to the Attorney General, the Attorney General uh, received that information as well as other information. She'd already been apprised, of course, of the December negotiations regarding um, their offer to plead. So it's not like she wasn't um, prepared for to receive that type of offer now. How many bombings did he plead guilty to? Uh, well, he pled, pled to all five um, of the charged bombings, including the one that was charged in New Jersey. Um, but we took a factual basis to all 16 of the bombs. So he admitted to all 16. Uh, in the uh, Rule 11 proceedings, uh, the judge usually asks the uh, defendant some questions. When the judge asked him his occupation, do you recall what his answer was? Uh, he, he said something, I suppose I'm an inmate, something like that. <laughs> yes, prison inmate. Yes. Uh, what sentence did he receive? Four consecutive life sentences. As a, uh, as a uh, epilogue, uh, what happened to the land upon which the, the, the cabin was situated? Uh, a couple years after the criminal proceedings came to a conclusion, a woman stepped forward asking to purchase the land. Um, unlike other possessions, uh, pretty much you have to sell the land to somebody. It can't just sit there titleless. Uh, so we um, did some investigation of her and finally decided that we would not stand in the way of that purchase and Judge Hollows signed off on the purchase of the one and a quarter acre parcel that the cabin sat on. And what happened to the cabin itself? The cabin uh, remained at Mather Air Force Base for a number of years. I think just recently in the last couple of years, maybe five years was uh, transported to the museum in Washington, D.C., which is where it is now. Actually, I think it went to the FBI, took it, and then held it for a while, and then, right. and then moved it to the museum as part of an exhibit there about this case. How about all the contents of the cabin? What happened to them? <clears throat> uh, well, after a bunch, bunch of litigation, uh, there was an order made that, they, that the contents should be sold by the marshals and the proceeds should be uh, given to the victims as part of the uh, in payment of restitution. That essentially closes the book. We're running a little late, but I want to ask each of our panelists if they could close with a one or two minute uh, statement about uh, what you learned as a result of this whole experience and what it means to you. Terry? Thank you, Judge. I learned uh, and had reiterated a lesson that uh, there's no way, whether it's the FBI, federal, state, local agency, that we could ever come close to solving these kinds of crimes, especially the ones involving lone actors, without help from the public. And I think uh, many times when you look at how something comes together, you don't realize that in many of these, in fact, uh, recent terrorist cases, uh, cases where either or acts of terror where they're prevented by someone alert in the public deciding to do something about it and take the information they have or their observation of someone, 
and uh, in many other instances, the case is solved and uh, people are arrested. Uh, it takes tremendous courage and conviction and decency to come forward and then to, to begin the work with us of trying to pull things together. And when I look back at this and I think of uh, all those qualities that David possessed, people such as the victims who, uh, like Gary, who uh, were always constantly there for us even and, and showed such great courage with all the things that had happened to them. Uh, I think it touches you deeply. It makes you realize why you got involved in law enforcement. But um, it serves as a constant reminder that we have to go to the public and give them as much as we can give them so that we can use their support and their help to find out how to bring these cases to a conclusion. Gary? Yeah, that's, uh, I'd probably talk about that for a long time, but um, squeezing that into a couple of minutes, I guess the, a couple of things I learned would be that I don't think anybody knows what they're going to do with something like this until you're actually in it. You learn a lot about that, a lot about yourself, a lot about people. Um, you learn a lot about the people sitting at this table, lots and lots of people that I dealt with through a lot of years, um, especially not knowing for nine years who it was. Um, a lot of friendships developed on all sides of law enforcement and prosecution, defense. Um, I have a lot of friends that way. Um, uh, kind of echoing a little bit what Terry said, I felt like it was my job to get uh, out and do what I could as a victim, uh, if you will, because I don't really like that word as a judge had mentioned. I'm a survivor. Paris Hilton's a victim. So <laughs> just, just thought I'd put it, that out there. But uh, um, yeah, in my, in my world, I mean, I was approached to go out and do things like Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, things like that where it had never been done. And it, there's a certain amount of risk that goes with that. I mean, whether or not somebody's coming back at you or not. But that's the way, in my world, things worked. My dad was a state trooper, so I grew up that way. So I just really more or less appreciated a lot around the system. I appreciated what it offered me um, and the ability that I actually had a voice. So when you are in the middle of that, I think it's, um, well, in my world, the job to get up and say you have a voice. So I continue to do that. Thank you. Quinn? No, oh, excuse me, Steve. <laughs> I was going to say. All right. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if these are uh, great insights or anything, but, but I came, came away from the experience with a couple of, of thoughts. One is, in, and I think Terry would, would agree with this entirely, you have to constantly re-examine your assumptions. Um, there were so many false leads in this case, case uh, instances where we thought we had the Unabomber on the line, this has to be the guy. There are coincidences that just can't be explained away. And they were explained away. Uh, and so constantly, when I, I hold that with me, whenever I was conducting investigations after that, I would continue to re-examine the, the assumptions. The other one has nothing to do with law. It has more to do with the fickleness of fate. There were several of these instances that could easily have resulted in the death of more individuals. Um, Gil Murray, the victim of bomb number 16, which occurred just about five blocks from this building. Um, the, the package was delivered in a big, one of those white mail tubs to the business. The bomb was actually sitting on top. The mail was late that day. Um, so all the employees of the Timber Association were kind of congregating around the reception area to get their mail. Um, Gil Murray was called out to receive his package, which actually wasn't even addressed to him. It was addressed to the prior president. Um, it was a very tightly wrapped package with brown uh, packing paper. It was designed to detonate uh, when the tension on that packing paper was released. So if you just release the tape, that's enough to explode the device. FBI still doesn't know how um, that was possible. In any event, Gil Murray comes out. There are about eight people standing around the counter, leafing through their mail, having discussions when Gil Murray is trying to open this package. He's having difficulty because it's so tightly wrapped. He can't do it with his fingers, so he asks the receptionist for a pair of scissors. As this is going on, one by one, people are filtering away. 
one person gets a phone call, has to go back to his office. Another person calls a coworker aside to the hallway to talk about at some point. Other people are simply getting their mail and going back. As he's handing, uh, as the receptionist is handing the scissors to Gil Murray, she gets a phone call. The caller wants to know um, the number of another person. It's not on the Rolodex uh, at the reception desk. The receptionist, who is just filling in for the real receptionist for the lunch hour, says, puts the caller on hold, goes back to her office to uh, retrieve the information. She gets about 10 steps outside the hall when the bomb explodes. Gil Murray is the only one killed because he's the only one left in the reception area at that time. Had the bomb exploded 30 seconds earlier, there probably would have been a half a dozen fatalities. The same story repeats itself with Thomas Mosier, the, the victim of Bond 15. His wife and daughter, um, one and a half year old daughter, I think, come into the kitchen uh, just as he's starting to open the package. The daughter needs a diaper change. The wife does a 180, leaves the area, goes back to do the diaper change. The bomb explodes and Thomas Mosier is killed, killed instantly. There are other examples of that, but I just hold on to that thought that, you know, as they say, but for the grace of God, uh, we could have had a lot of, a lot more fatalities. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I guess uh, what I take away from it is a great uh, admiration and respect for David Kaczynski. Uh, he, he and his, his mom were estranged from Ted because of Ted's mental illness, but, but he was, they were very supportive of him. And when actually, I think, I think uh, as Gary says, it was David's wife who really started saying, could that be Ted? And then when he realized he thought it could be, and he was just torn between this, on the one hand, this is my brother, and it, what, if, what, if I turn him in, what will they do to him? On the other hand, if I don't, and he's really the Unabomber, will be more people be killed? And, and, he, and he went through that, that horrible back and forth, and then with the help of this, this wonderful lawyer from, from Washington, D.C., Tony Basegli, came forward, and, and it, was the, it was the key to this case. I don't know if the task force would have got there sooner or later, but it would have been a while, I think. And, and David was, was given a, a reward, uh, a million dollars, I think, and he dedicated it to helping other victims. He was going to use it solely for that. He's, he and Gary, who Gary could speak about more, have become friends, I think is a, certainly a fair statement, yeah. and, and they have gone together to, to talk to victims groups and, and to, um, I, Gary can speak for more of that, but he's continued in that area, in the death penalty area, and he also has come together with a... Um, the brother of a, of a fellow by the name of uh, Manny Babbitt, who was a, uh, a California state capital uh, defendant. And, he, and uh, the brother of Manny Babbitt turned him in and, and the state executed him. So the two of them go around and talk about victims and, and responsibility. So I, I just think they're wonderful. And I, I think Gary's wonderful. He's, he's, he's been much more giving whatever words and then uh, any than I ever would have been <laughs> ah, thank you Clint. thank you this concludes the presentation uh, we want to invite all of you to attend the reception in the Anthony M Kennedy Learning Center downstairs uh, where there will not only be refreshments but the panelists will be available to talk with you answer any questions that you might have and uh, there is an exhibit there of uh, uh, photographs and uh, evidence that would have been used at the trial of the United States versus Theodore Kaczynski had that trial actually gone forward. Thank you very much.